Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with hosts Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please look us up on your favorite podcast app, subscribe, like, and share so that you never miss an episode. If you'd like to further support us, visit patreon.com slash speaking out and check out the different rewards. You'll find exclusive rewards if you sign up as a patron of the podcast. Thank you for your support and let's get into the show. Welcome to this week's podcast. Uh, thank you again to our patrons who make the podcast possible. Um, we appreciate you guys. We love your support. We just got done doing a live Q and A yes, with um, we patrons. We had some fun. We did that <laughs> conversations. Was a really it, was, great... it was actually a lot of fun. Yes, we had a good time. It was. So yes. we uh, we have all kinds of uh, tiers and and different uh, rewards for patrons. So. Uh, that's one of the ones that we offer for our patrons is a once a month uh, Q and A, and it was it was a- absolutely fantastic. We, we loved it. Did a lot of work, and we ended on a really fun note. So we did. Yes. So we'd love to have you join us. Absolutely. Um, okay. So this week we we wanted to talk about um, why we are still Christians, um, and this is not a rebuttal to. Uh, our friend Eric Skorzynski, who did an excellent, excellent mm-hmm. podcast. Um, it was a year ago. Uh, his was titled, Why I Am No Longer a Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he did a fantastic job. He I did. thought um, yeah. he articulated why he believes what he believes, yes. um, why, uh, why and how he got to where he's at now. Mm-hmm. He said, and don't come and try to try to proselytize me yeah. and use all these arguments about why God exists. I've heard them all. He said, I used to mm-hmm. teach them all. Um, and so I thought um, he just did a really good job of explaining how he got to where he's at and, and mm-hmm. why. Uh, he also, I thought, was incredibly respectful um, to people who are still Christians. And he said, I'm not here to convince people mm-hmm. that there is no God. Right. I'm just telling you about my journey. So, <coughs> Granny's, uh, I keep trying to tell her to go to the doctor, but she refuses. So, you guys can yell at her and no tell her yelling. that she needs to take care of this herself. This is sounding better by the <laughs> she, hour. <laughs> she had this big coughing fit. She goes, I'm, I'm sounding, I'm feeling so much it's better, better, Jimmy. better by the like, hour, people. <laughs> it is. It's like, it sounds like you're healthy as a horse, Granny. <laughs> I am. Be nice to me. Oh, people. goodness. So... Um, so anyway, (laughs) um, I thought that it'd be really important for people to know, and we, we get asked this a lot, like, why do you still believe in God? Um, where, where, where is God in your life right now? Like, where do you stand with God? So I thought it'd be really good for people, especially in the advocacy, um, community, like for all the survivors, I know so many people struggle with faith. There are countless survivors who uh, are still Christians. Uh, they're they're just kind of wondering, like, what about you guys? Um, where do you mm-hmm. stand? So I can speak personally from my experience. Um, and then I want to hear, I want to hear yours sure. too. Um, for me, I am still a believer. Obviously, I'm, I'm a preacher. Um, so I I wrote about this in my book and talked about how, you know, I I just I wanted to know where God was and to me God was really um, sick and twisted and demented if if He was present and was watching these things happen to the most innocent um, innocent of all creatures and He did nothing to stop it. Uh, you know, when He had the power supposedly um, to give my dad a heart attack to, you know, whatever, like stop him somehow. Um, and he didn't. And, and so I had to really wrestle with my faith and everything I thought I knew about God. Um, it was completely just obliterated. And, uh, you know, I, I I wrote about how I kind of got this answer back and I don't hear voices. I don't, you know, like I just, to me, that's not who God is. I, I certainly don't get all these yeah. people that say, I received a prophecy and, that, you know, God told me to do this. I, I think, honestly, I think it's just nonsense. Um, but that's my opinion, whatever. Um, so, you know, I, I think more it was just my inner calmness, you know, 
saying, uh, where were my people? In other words, right. if, if you really are, mm-hmm. if, you know, it's that question in yes. reverse. Like, mm-hmm. if you really are a child of mine, mm-hmm. um, where were you when all this stuff right. was going on? Mm-hmm. Um, because if we're really to be the hands and the feet of Jesus, which I think we are, um, I think that strips away all of this religious nonsense where we just, were, you know, in our live Q and A, we were talking about Todd Bentley, and Todd Bentley is just—it's scandal after scandal after scandal after scandal. The most abusive man, you know, he drop kicks people in the name of Jesus, and just absolutely is an embarrassment to Christianity. Um, and this guy's just milking people for for millions of dollars. Um, and Todd, you know, it will say things like, well, God told me to do this. And, you know, it never quotes scripture. I don't think he probably has read the Bible from cover to cover in his life. That's sad. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and so it's people like Todd Bentley who give us a bad name and it's the abusers who give all Christians a bad name, just like cops. You know, you have, you have your 10 to 20% of cops who, who are horrific human beings uh, who are an embarrassment to the uniform. And so people associate that badness with everybody. So all cops are bad. None of them are protectors. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. None of them have the ability or care enough to protect. And so I had to distance myself from that kind of logic. And and this is, again, this is my journey. Right. But I had, uh, you know, friends in college who would tell me things like, well, I'm giving up on on the idea of God because I had a bad experience at church. And they would describe their experience, and it wasn't even abuse. Mm-hmm. And they would just describe yeah. these experiences, and I'm like, no, that's that's a bad experience because there are crappy people in this world. Like, right. that has yeah. nothing to do with God. Mm-hmm. That has to do with people using the name of God right. to shout down other mm-hmm. people or to embarrass them or to put them in their place or whatever. And you're going to have that in any any structure. Any organization is going to have those kinds of people, those kinds of personalities. So for me, I always took the approach that if God really is real, I want to find that out on my own. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do it. I, I don't want to believe in God because right. people tell me to. I don't want to believe certain ways because people tell me to. I don't want to give up on God because a few people suck, you know, like right. for yep. me, um, Oops. God became very real. I think in, in the darkest moments because I had nothing left of myself yep. and, um, you know, you can't really describe something that you experience. Uh, it's hard to put into words. And, and for me, I began to see God in the faces of people who would cry with me. And it wasn't many, Mm -hmm. but there was that handful of people Mm -hmm. who treated me with such kindness and grace Mm -hmm. and compassion and understanding and um, mercy. And, you know, like, I, I, I began to see that God and feel that God was real to me mm-hmm. and that I needed somebody who has control over all this chaos that's in the world. Um, and you look around and like, for me, it's just so hard to deny that there's a supreme being, mm-hmm. that there's somebody who formed all of this. And, and you know, for me, like it just, it, it makes no sense. And I've heard scientists try to explain how, this stuff all just happened by chance. You know, you look outside and you look at the the complexity of the human body and the Mm -hmm. human mind and the human soul and the human heart and the emotions and just all this complex stuff. And I'm like, for that to just happen, that was just just a coincidence. There's not a capacity Mm -hmm. in my brain for all these complexities and all these patterns that we see in the world. There, You know, the number seven... You find it all throughout the Bible. You find it in the creation narrative and, you know, believe what you want to believe about the creation narrative. But these patterns are there. You know, you have 
you have the sevens in there, you have seven colors in the rainbow, you have, mm-hmm. um, in a full scale in music, you have seven notes um, from end to end till you jump to the next octave. You have just everywhere you see this stuff patterned. Seven days in that, a week. That can't seven, be yeah. mm-hmm. chance. Right. It can't be chance. Um, and so, I, so for me, that was kind of my journey was going back and, and, and saying, I would be really arrogant to say that there's n- there's not a being that's smarter than I am or that mm-hmm. even exists. Mm-hmm. And so, so again, for me, it was this really uh, humbling approach to say, I have no problem with there being a higher power than mm-hmm. me, with there being a God who formed all of the universe and all this and all its complexity and beauty and brokenness and all that other stuff. Um, so that in a nutshell, that's my journey. Um, so I still am absolutely a believer. I still, I have days where I struggle. Um, I'm not the kind of person who cliches people and sprinkles Bible verses, telling them that Mm -hmm. just put your trust in God and your day will go better. That's just not, that's not found anywhere in the Bible that if you believe in God, Life is going to go easy for you. That you're not going to be we're harassed. Told the opposite, actually. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. You're promised um, persecution and uh, brokenness and illness, and those things just happen in a broken world. And that's not because God sits back and doesn't care. And you know, so for me, God becomes very real because I I need Him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the crux of it, Jimmy. Um, My journey with God began at a very young age. I came from a very abusive, broken family, and I was blessed enough to have a grandmother who introduced God to our family and who um, parents who, even though they were really um, a mess, I guess, saw to it to take me to Sunday school every week. And it was through that early introduction to this being called God that I anchored myself. And I remember the day when I was given my first Bible, I was in fourth grade. I remember my uh, King James Version Bible with red lettering ordered from the Sears Roebuck catalog that my grandmother got for me. And I, even though I was in fourth grade, which is a young age, I would come home from school, get off the bus, and immediately, before I did anything else, I stood um, in reverence and respect to God and read from my Bible. You know, some kids would call that corny or weird or whatever, but Also, when I came home, I had a critically ill sister, a mother who was a very um, severe alcoholic who had um, all kinds of mental issues, a father who was pretty absent in my life. So this, these words that I held in my hand were not just words. They were very real to me. And I memorized a lot of the Bible at a very early age, not because I had to, but because I wanted to. And there's something genuinely miraculous, I think, when we plant the seed in the hearts of young children. And I will forever be grateful to my grandmother for, you know, seeing to it that that seed was planted in my heart, um, I fall far short of doing what she did for me and my grandchildren. I have, sadly, some grandchildren that I don't know if they um, have an awareness of God, at least not on the level that I'd like for them. But, you know, progress later in life and um, hard things came along. Uh, My sister died. My parents divorced. My mother became worse. Uh, with her alcoholism, we lost our home. 
um, I know what it is to walk off the bus and say, um, where is my mother? She would go missing for two weeks at a time when I was very young, um, had a sister to take care of. And these were times that I, you, you said in your darkest hours, mm -hmm. you clung to God and or that being, whatever it was. And I think that's very true for me. It was in my dark hours that when I would reach out, that gave me stability. And it still does. And, that I, and I think that's because you have nothing left. I mean, you've been it so emptied. So true of everything yes that you literally have nothing left but isn't that true of one of god's truest promises too that in his word he promises to never leave us and i found that god's promises have always held true people's promises do not mm -hmm. we all fail each other miserably and i think we get in trouble with our faith when we begin placing our trust in people as hard as we try as much as i love you as my son i have disappointed you as your mother i know i have never many many <laughs> times um and i will i mm -hmm. i will continue yeah. to yeah we all that's do. because i'm human mm -hmm. um but god in his word says, I'll, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never disappoint you. Hang in there with me because I love you that much. And I found that to be true. When your brother Mike died, I never felt an emptiness or a brokenness like that. Um, I had never felt anything like that. Yet I knew God was there. And he was and gave me some kind of an internal peace that I can't explain to another. But just as you said, you you when your dad, when we found out about his dark, very dark, dark life, that was like a piercing of the heart, a stabbing of everything we knew to be true and good at that point in our lives mm -hmm. as a family. That went dark, but God did not. God's light was still there. And I think that um, faith is not just um, a reading of the word, but an indwelling of the word. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And when that seed is planted there, we may stray, we may question a lot from time to time, but that seed, take seed when it has rooted properly, continues to grow and continues to give us that hope and that direction, that truth. So um, God has to this point in my life never been not real. God has always been real to me. Have I been disappointed with life? Absolutely. Life has, you know, dealt some hard blows. Yeah. Have I been disappointed in God? Absolutely not. God has not failed me. And for that, I am so thankful. See, I took a different approach mm -hmm. for me. I was flat out angry. I was, mm -hmm. I was mad. I yelled at, I yelled at God. I cussed at God. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I would do it all over again. Right. And for me, we it was so take, helpful right, to be able to right. do that, to lament and to scream out, right. um, you did this, you know, you mm -hmm. allowed, you allowed this to happen. I did a lot of that when I was younger, um, when my mother was at her worst with the alcoholism, I and when my sister died, you know, did a lot of that kind of reckoning with God, mm -hmm. asking, "Where are you? Why are you doing this? We're we're just little kids here, living, trying to be okay. God, we're trying to be okay. Yep. Where are you?" So I I yeah. think I went through that stage, and went through a totally different stage than later. Yeah. And it's called our relationship with God, that's all. As yeah. his child, that we, we go through different phases with God. But it's always interesting to me, um, you know, just not even as a, as a minister, um, just as a believer. It's interesting to me that people get so hung up on all these different things. Like, you know, we, he we hear this a lot in 
our particular uh, tribe. Work. Yeah. Uh, you know, because because we're not full egalitarian, and you know, mm-hmm. I I hear so much, and I'm talking just in the worship service, in that one hour worship service, right? And so, you know, believe what you want to believe about. Um, equality and all that stuff, and which I I am all for. You know, I I look Say at the it. women's well, rights. Well, well no, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, you look I at the know. Bible and look yeah. at the women who who are mm-hmm. absolutely just one hundred percent helpful, not just helpful, but leading in ministries throughout the throughout the Bible and changing lives, and like they were so True involved service. and so active, and yeah. you know, the very yes. first. The very first w- woman uh, person who meets Jesus as a baby in the temple is Hannah. It's this woman. Mm-hmm. She's been mm-hmm. praying for years, and you know she holds Jesus and she blesses him. And, you know, mm-hmm. so you have all these women who who are so instrumental and so important and so valued. Yet Jesus lived in this very androcentric um, society that said the man rules the roost, and mm-hmm. you know. In the worship setting, especially, mm-hmm. you know, women were not up front and in, mm-hmm. in center, and so he didn't come into that space and say, "We need to free women for this one hour and get them to read scriptures in front of people." Mm-hmm. What he did is he said, "All right, um, I, I'm, I need you." Um, he took wealthy women who were so troubled in their life; um, they were prominent women, Mary Magdalene, yeah. who had seven demons. You know, here's this woman who was so troubled and she was wealthy and and those Galilean women followed Jesus his entire ministry. And I think they're so overshadowed wrongfully by the ministry and the work that Jesus did. They were vital to his ministry. And I don't think that he would mm-hmm. place them in his shadow and be like, you know, no. pat them on the head kind of thing. And so, you know, f- for me, it's interesting that we... I see people fight over these issues and we got to get, we got to get women up front and and I'm just picking one issue, but whatever the issue is. And it's like, they focus on that one hour. And, and I say, I look at my own daughter, my daughter's 12 years old. Um, She's raised so far, you know, three times uh, $7,500 for a well that services hundreds and hundreds of people that literally gave them life. Um, and, and she raises money. I mean, Mm -hmm. this, this year was, uh, this last year was probably the longest that it took. And we just kind of, we were so busy with other stuff, but I think it was like 40 days. She's a little natural. Um, Yeah. And so I look at stuff like that and I'm like, this is how God works in our lives. Mm -hmm. Not that one, I could care less about that one hour Mm -hmm. on Sunday morning that everybody fights over and we have all these divisions and we're like, oh, the church sucks and people suck and I'm leaving the church because I had a bad experience on that one hour. That one hour should not dictate your belief in God and it shouldn't dictate um, your work on this planet. I appreciate, and I'm going to interject here, your knowledge of the Bible. And I think the more we study the Word of God and study the Bible, the more real God becomes to us because there's it's all truth. And when we understand, oh, okay, this is how Jesus walked and talked among men and women. This is how he built relationships with them. Jesus becomes real and until Jesus becomes real, we can't build a faith. We, mm-hmm. we really cannot until prayer becomes an everyday conversational piece with God. Our faith can't grow. And it is far more than that one hour together. Far, far, far we more. Put, and that we put 90% of our hour, focus on that one right, hour. Is so minuscule in the scope of things. In my relationship with God, that hour is like here compared to all the rest. Same of, here. Yeah. Uh, it, it, of it, my it, walk and talk with God. Yeah. Um, but you're right. We we lose focus. But listen to people talk about about their church. Yeah. And what do they start talking about? Oh, we have this program and this mm-hmm. program. When you come in, 
we have the kids center and we have this and we have that and we have this great production and we have the great band and, we, and I'm thinking so what who cares I've always what are you doing that's one hour that when we talk of God and Jesus as though they are a real part of us they become real mm -hmm. when Jesus is a very common name within the home within the family uh, within our prayers when God is an everyday conversation God becomes real mm -hmm. when we sit God to the side and we only reserve that word for one hour a week we lose track it's like within any relationship if I only talk to you once a year we wouldn't have much much of a relationship we don't know each other a lot yeah the more I spend time with you, the more I know you, the more you know me. And that is, you know, when we think of, of God in that sense, it, it's a relationship. And also I appreciated your um, articulation of nature and all the the intertwinings of the body and the mind and the way it's everything works. It's so complex. Works. It so is. Complex. And when we study that, everything's timed to a millisecond mm -hmm. with the way our heart pumps blood and the way this system works with that system and the way the body can heal even when you're barking like a seal um yeah hack it up granny hack I those lungs am, up i am but it's it's it just becomes these miracles of life that you know you become so thankful for that we're part of do i understand the all of god no never will no yeah and i, never I don't either will um not in this life yeah no do i believe in a god yes yeah. i do yeah. but you know i mean with that said like i have tremendous respect for unbelievers i i have respect for um why they believe it and, and in fact um i thought eric did such a good job i was like i wish I wish the Christians could articulate as well as mm -hmm. he did why he's no he longer a, a believer. Job. He did. I wish yeah. Christians could articulate mm -hmm. why they're believers, and usually you can't get them to articulate he it. He showed like, no anger. Not at he all. He showed no, no um, judgment mm -hmm. on anyone. He just said, "Here is where I am, and this is why." Right. And you know, I think the more we share, also the more we learn from each other. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to use caution that we use the Bible as our basis, as our foundation. When we stray from that and begin listening only to the teachings of others, we get into a lot of trouble. I know I do. Yeah, and I think yeah. you can certainly use them in tandem, too. And that's mm -hmm. where Christians have gone yeah. wrong, where they're like, oh, my goodness, it's not, it doesn't come from the Bible, and, you know, so we're not going to listen. No. Or, yeah. It's the worldly people. And I'm like, some of my very best friends and biggest mentors are people who they cuss like sailors. They, you know, like they're just, they have no belief in God whatsoever. Um, so I think it's a give and take. Uh, you know, Paul constantly uh, quotes stoic philosophers and all these people mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. had zero belief in right. in god above mm -hmm. but paul respects their writings and he respects their their perspective and paul quotes from them um in the bible you know and he's not the only one jesus does too and you look at different people and they're like there's value in in the human mind and we're all on this planet together right. and that's that's the bible the great is thing. an exciting book to read and if we read it that way, it is an eye opener. Every mm -hmm. word really is an eye opener, and we can never get enough of it. And it's wonderful, yeah. you know. Just but, is. yeah, I mean, I I think I'll end on that note that you know I I understand, especially when people are abused in the name of God. Oh my, I yes. totally get why um, they no longer believe in God. Um, but the other side of that coin is I know other survivors who um, they're afraid to say that they believe in God because mm -hmm. they're afraid they'll they'll be attacked for for, for not giving up on God, on the idea of God because they were abused by somebody. And, and, and again, you know, I know for me, and I would know from talking to different survivors, when that's all you have left, that's mm -hmm. that's what you happily cling to. And uh, I have interject. no reservations I mean, whatsoever. I, I don't think we'll ever understand why there's so much human suffering. When I read 
about slavery times, I weep. Mm -hmm. That hits me so hard. I, I can't stand the thought of humans being mistreated when I think about um, the, the Jews and the persecution of the Jews. It just, I don't know how, the, how humans can be inhumane like that and how a God watches over and allows it until I think of some of the results of this and how we got from there, there to here to there. Mm -hmm. And when you piece it all together, there is a cloth that's being woven that is a cloth that always guides us back to God. Always. Yeah. Always, always, always. And within that, you're going to have very broken, oh, very manipulative, very, very deceptive people. Uh, always has and been. And that's just always. That's part of human nature. Yeah. And that doesn't make God mm -hmm. any less real or any no. less valuable. Um, you're always going to find liars, cheaters, uh, killers, rapists. That's a given. That they're, they're always going to be there. And they're always going to wear... Because we have Satan. Yeah. We I mean, you're going to... forget... Have people who wear the label of Christian mm -hmm. um, who are anything but, and that's just a fact. But that doesn't that doesn't make me jaded towards God and say, "Well, you, you just, you know, you must not be real." Then faith um, is hard me, to that explain, never... isn't it, Jimmy? To another, it is. I mean, because it's something you have to kind of experience and experience mm -hmm. in a healthy way. Um, mm -hmm. And and so, you know, when Eric described it, I, I thought it was brilliant. Like he talked about how mm -hmm. unhealthy. An environment he was in, and very toxic. Everything about very God was toxic twisted. church environment. Yeah, he had. very, so, very. Yeah, toxic. It's, it's tough, but yeah, yeah I mean, uh, like, I, I think, I think we're foolish if we pass judgment on people and mm -hmm. say, well, you yeah. have to believe in God or you can't live a a, no. a good life. Well, there are plenty of people who live great lives, um, who are unbelievers, you know, and so. I think we need to we need to share our space with them on this mm -hmm. planet Earth and and not draw a line in the sand and you know I still have I have plenty of friends uh, who don't believe in God um, and I respect them they respect me right. and you know mm -hmm. um, we're on this planet. I believe together. it's a greater life with God, but I I, I, I fully do not, too. But I'm not going to twist somebody's never, arm either. Never. Or yeah. or talk down to them like they're yeah. less than me because they're they don't believe in God like that's insanity. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, there are plenty of people in the Bible who who talk to people who were full out pagans like Paul. You know, when Paul was on Mars Hill in Athens, uh, I mean, you want to talk about uh, like they had so many gods. They have the statue to an unknown god just in case yeah, they missed yeah. one. And I love how Paul starts his speech to these people. He's not being sarcastic. He says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are a very religious people. Mm -hmm. He commends them. I know. And then he says about, about this unknown God, let me tell you about mm -hmm. this unknown God. Yeah. And then he gives his take on who God is. Anybody who wants to, to, to listen and learn more. Uh, Paul was was welcome. Anybody who walked away, Paul didn't shout at them and this tell them how stupid I mean. they are. are like so he many, respected them. So many illustrations we can draw from the Bible to help us today mm -hmm. in our walk, just our walk through life. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But that's uh, that's kind of where where we're at. And I, I thought we've never really talked about why we still believe in God and believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like we never really had a whole episode right. to address it and yeah. talk about it. So anyway, okay. um, now you know where we stand and uh, we hope that for those of, of you, why. Yeah. for those of you who um, are believers and, and still uh, struggle with your faith, uh, you're not alone. You know, uh, we've all had our struggles and some days are harder than others, but, right. uh, oh, but yeah. we're here and we stand, uh, we stand unapologetically um, as believers and as Christians and, uh, mm -hmm. That's where we're at. And appreciate journey. and love you all. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So uh, thank you guys for tuning in, and we will catch you next episode. Thanks again for listening to today's episode. A special thank you to our patrons who make this podcast possible. 
Please help us get the word out by searching for the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast in your favorite podcast app. Be sure to hit subscribe and rate the show. Please consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron and check out the rewards our patrons receive.